I thank you so much for coming. I went ahead and uh, picked up the books that you were interested in reading. And um, I'm going to go ahead and do some sample reads for you. And hopefully help you figure out which one you are wanting to read first. Yeah. Sample read? Have you never been sample read to? Okay. Well, a sample reading is when the reader will just flip through a book and choose a page at random and read to you. Personally, I find this as a really good way to see if this is a book that you would be interested in reading. I think it tells you a lot more than the back does. Or, you know, the, the inside flaps. So, please enjoy. Um, I wanted to start off with a sample reading of Life of Pi. Alright. <sighs> Chapter 13 You see if you fall into a lion's pit, the reason the lion will tear you to pieces is not because it's hungry. Be assured, zoo animals are amply fed, or because it's bloodthirsty. But because you've invaded its territory. As an aside, that is why a circus trainer must always enter the lion rink first, and in full sight of the lions. In doing so, he establishes that the ring is his territory, and not theirs. A notion that he reinforces by shouting and stomping about, by snapping his whip the lions are impressed. Their disadvantage weighs heavily on them. And notice how they come in, mighty predators. Though they are kings of beasts, they crawl in with their tails low, and they keep to the edges of the ring, which is always round, so that they have nowhere to hide. They are in the presence of a strong, dominant male, a super alpha male, and they must submit to his dominance rituals. So they open their jaws wide, they sit up, they jump through paper-covered hoops, they crawl through tubes, they walk backwards, they roll over. He's a queer one, they think dimly. Never seen a top lion like him, but he runs a good pride. The larder is always full, and let's be honest, mates. His antics keep us busy. Napping all the time does a bit, does get a bit boring. At least we're not riding bicycles like the brown bears, or catching flying plates like the gym.
Richard Parker was tougher than I was in the face of these fish, and far more efficient. He raised himself and went about blocking, swiping and biting all the fish he could. Many were eaten live and whole, struggling wings beating in his mouth. It was a dazzling display of it, might and speed. Actually, it was not so much the speed that was impressive as the pure animal confidence, the total absorption in the moment. Such a mix of ease and concentration, such a being in the present, would be the envy of Elias Dukes. So, there are two sample readings for you. Let's just uh, think about those for a while. Ready? The next one, it is by Carl Heisen. It is called Nature Girl, and uh, yeah, I noticed that too. The colors are very, very bright, and this particular one is paper. Honestly, prefer paperback. So, let's begin our sample read. His father was the only man that Honey Santana had ever married, and they astonished themselves by staying together 17 years. The sea change took place after Fry was born. He spent two weeks in the hospital fighting to breathe, and it was during that wrenching time that Honey began hearing musical static in her head. Battling uncontrollable spells of apprehension and dread, overreacting, sometimes radically, to the bad behavior of total strangers. From the day she brought Fry home, Honey was gripped with a fear of losing him to a random act of nature, an incurable illness, or criminal recklessness of some genetically deficient numbskull. The fright sometimes manifested itself in unexpected ways. Unacceptable ways. Once, when Honey had seen a car speeding down her street, she dashed out and hurled a 40-gallon garbage can in its path, brandishing the demolished receptacle. She then accosted the stunned driver. This could have been my kid, you flattened, she screamed. You could have killed my little boy. Another time when Fry was in the fourth grade, she watched a motorcycle blow through the school zone and nearly strike one of his classmates. Honey had hoped, hopped into her husband's truck and trailed the biker to a tourist bar. When the man emerged two hours later, his motorcycle was missing. The next day, a purple plume of smoke led park rangers to a high-end Kawasaki crotch rocket, burned to scrap on the gravel road near the Shark River slum. Do 
Do you have any thoughts on this one? Well, thank you so much for sharing. Let's go ahead and pick out it. book is full of spiders by David Walk. I um, particularly like the texture of this one. People don't think about it, but I think if the, your book has a really nice texture, It'll help people enjoy the story more. Let's begin that, um, sample reading. Soy sauce. John twisted the silver bottle. It separated in the middle, along a seam that was invisible when it was closed. He didn't open it all the way. He'd learned that wasn't always wise. If the soy sauce was awake. A thin black stream leaked out from the crack. It looked like the length of a heavy black string that had unspooled. John laid his index finger under the stream to catch it. Then several things happened at once. First, the shuffling footsteps John thought he had been hearing got. Louder and louder. They had a hollow tone, like someone stomping around on the floor above your apartment. John and Falconer both spun looking for the source. Then something leaped off the neighbor's roof, sailing through the air like a huge, weaponized flying squirrel coming right down on Falconer. John's brain had a tenth of a second to try to register what he was really seeing, but when the soy sauce made its move, at the exact moment, at the exact same moment, John's mouth was forming the words, Falconer Buck. The thin, black string of soy sauce coiled around on its own like a snake in a blink whipping around his finger, over his finger now and digging into his skin, right at the sensitive spot where a hangnail would form. Pain flashed up John's hand, all the way to his elbow. Then the soy sauce took hold, and the world disappeared. David once described taking a hit of soy sauce as like digging up one of those thick fiber optic lines that feeds an entire city's internet connection and plugging it into your brain. All those streams of data crashing into your neurons at once, so hard and fast that you simultaneously know everything and nothing at all. John always thought his description was clearer. It's like an insane clown posse concert where all 50,000 members of the audience are given their own microphone and sound system and they all start simultaneously improvising bad freestyle rap verses. I can't tell you what this book is about. Were you wanting me 
to read more. Just a little bit. Amy peed a lot when she got tense, a nervous bladder, and three hour long bus ride. Don't make for a great combination. But worrying wasn't something she could just turn off. Her roommate at school had taught her some Tai Chi, but that wasn't the sort of thing you could do on a bus without being asked to leave. She couldn't get David or John on the phone, and that was weird. I came to and sat up. People were standing around, nobody running, no sign of Frankie. Some time had passed. The horizon was expletive, a sun casting a glow on a layer of fog that was settling. In the low areas, like puddles of ghost expletive, I saw John about ten feet away, on his feet but bent over at the waist. Gripping his pants at the knees, he was blinking as if trying to focus his eyes. John, you all right? He nodded, still looking at the ground. Yeah, I'm thinking that sound he made melted our brains. Did they get him? Don't know. I just came too. A white truck pulled up with the dish apparatus on the back. They had a TV station logo on the side. We were about to be on live TV. I tried to fix my hair with my hands. It's a good one. The Ultimate Hitchhiker's Guide Five Complete Novels And One Story So if you do choose to read this one first It's like several books in one Yeah Yeah Let's begin our sample reading sank through spinning blackness. Consciousness had died. Cold oblivion pulled the bodies down and down into the pit of unbeing. The roar of silence echoed dismally around them and they sank at last into a dark and bitter sea of heaving red that slowly engulfed them, seemingly forever. After what seemed an eternity, the sea receded and left them lying on a cold, hard shore, the flotsam and jetsam of the stream of life, the universe and everything. Cold spasm shook them, lights danced sickeningly around them. The cold, hard shore dipped and spun and then stood still. It shone darkly, it was very highly polished cold, hard shore. A green blur watched them disapprovingly. It coughed. 
<clears throat> Good evening, madam, gentlemen, it said. Do you have a reservation? Bored, perfect consciousness snapped back like elastic, making his brain smart. He looked up woozily at the green blur. Reservation, he said weakly. Yes, sir, said the green blur. Do you have a reservation for the afterlife? In so far as it is possible for a green, green blur to arch its eyebrows disdainfully, this is what the green blur now did. Afterlife, sir, it said. Does that sound interesting? I respect your opinion. Here we have Bad Monkey. B A D. This one's called Bad Monkey. Let us begin. shook his head apologetically. We don't wish to waste your time, Mr. Shook. You're not wasting my time. Are you kidding me? Peter said. I'm afraid we're no longer interested. This location, really, it isn't what we had in mind. Although your house looks quite airy and nice, Ol added. It will make an excellent vacation home for somebody, I'm sure. Evan shook, felt like his spine was being tapped. Look, the price isn't locked in stone. Let's go inside and get out of the sun. The construction crew won't be back till noon. We have cats, Peter said. So you see, this neighborhood would be out of the question. Ole elaborated politely. They are too old to outrun a horde of dogs. Inge is eleven. And Torhilda, Torhilda is thirteen. That's a pity, said Evan Shook. He sounded like a tire going flat. The Norwegians firmly shook his hand and departed in their rental car. Evan Shook glared across the fence. Yancey was leaning against the rail of his cedar deck. He had he had what appeared to be a shotgun under one arm, as if standing guard against another wolfish onslaught. Evan shook, spat on the ground, and slouched off toward the chill of his suburb. Yancey cranked up the Subaru's fitful AC and waited. So, which one were you thinking that you wanted to read first? I think that's an excellent choice. Alrighty. Well, when you're ready. 
ready for some more sample reading, meet me here. 